Thank you, Carl. Never know what Carl's going to say about me. <laughs> when he was in the basement, yeah, that was also the laundry room was off to the side. He got to see all kinds of interesting things. But um, anyway, thank you, Carl, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to be back in, in Canada and uh, to be able to come out in the morning and not be able to, or not need to scrape the windshield. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I mean, if you'd have told me that a couple of weeks ago, I wouldn't have thought it was possible. But like Carl said, the last time we were here, uh, the thermometer on our, on our car actually reached 34 below zero Fahrenheit for a while, while we were driving. And we thought we weren't going to make it out going south from Winnipeg. It was ridiculous. Um, but eventually we got back home in one piece. So it's good to be here. And uh, this, this morning, uh, I'm going to jump right in to kick off our time. Um, I'd like to share uh, some of my personal testimony and how I first came to learn about the One World Movement uh, and what I discovered. Uh, but I'd like to begin by going to the Word. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 is a really key passage of Scripture in the Bible. And... Um, we need to understand that whenever a uh, dragon is mentioned in Scripture, it's a symbolic reference to Satan, right? Okay, so I'm going to start in the second half of verse 2 and read on down through verse 8 of Revelation chapter 13. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. And the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. <clears throat> and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, that is, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So what this passage describes is an end times global political system that will use its economic and military power to enforce a type of religious worship. In the end, it's all about religion. Satan wants to be worshipped. He'd like for people to voluntarily worship him, but if he can't get everyone on board that way, he'll do what he can to force it in wanting to be God. And so people ask me a lot of times, where is world government mentioned in Scripture? Well, by that term, it's not mentioned, but it's described here in Revelation 13, and if you continue to read on into chapter 14 as well, it describes this uh, coming system. It will happen at some point. Uh, we're seeing the beginnings of it now. Actually, it's pretty far along, but it's, it's not fully to fruition yet. Thank the Lord. Um, but we know that it's going to be very deceptive. Uh, let's go over to Matthew chapter 24. And really, <clears throat> this entire chapter is so relevant um, but I'm just going to focus on, on three of the verses right now. Uh, verse 23 through 25, Jesus said, At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time, and if we were to read all of Matthew 24, really the theme of that chapter is that there is a coming deception that will be so huge that unless people are very discerning, they're going to get caught up in it. And much of this is going to come about in the name of Christ by people claiming to be Christians, 
but not being of Christ. And he made that very clear if you read that chapter uh, carefully. So again, these are times when we need to be on guard. And this information can be heavy. Uh, it can be difficult. But God gave us his prophecies in Scripture. And they were put there, I believe, for our generation so that we could identify these things as they unfold and not be uh, caught up in this uh, deception. So just a little bit about uh, my background and how I first began uh, to learn about the One World Movement. Uh, I really have to go back to my parents. Um, my father grew up in Croatia, and um, toward the end of World War II, uh, he, and, he and his family were given one to two days' notice. The communists were closing in, and they needed to either stay and become part of that or run for their lives, and they chose the latter. And so they formed a wagon train with a number of uh, relatives and neighbors, and they had enough time to pack a few suitcases and throw some pots and pans on the back of a wagon, a horse-drawn wagon, and they formed a wagon train with others, and they got out of there. And it was very similar to what's going on in Ukraine today. Uh, you just go wherever the fighting isn't just to try to stay alive, and that's what they did. Uh, they gave up their farm. They lost everything they, they had except what they could get onto the back of a wagon. And uh, eventually meandered through Hungary and then into Austria, where they found a place up in the mountains near Salzburg <clears throat> where they thought they'd, they'd be safe and be able to ride out the war. Well, almost immediately, they put dad, my dad, into a boarding school. Um, he was now... 13 years old. He was 12 when they fled, and he was now 13 years old in Austria, and in a boarding school about 20 to 30 miles away from his home. And um, after a, a few weeks, he thought, I'm sure not learning a lot of math or much of anything, but we're sure doing a lot of marching and drills. And so one day he was walking by the office of the headmaster, and the door was open a little bit. And he heard him in there talking to the guy who was second in command. And through that conversation, my dad came to find out that they were preparing these roughly 12 to 16-year-old kids at this boarding school to go fight for Hitler on the Eastern Front, basically be cannon fodder for the Nazis. And dad thought to himself, I didn't come this far and flee from the communists to now have to go to the Eastern Front for the Nazis. So that night, he and his friend jumped out of a two-story window and just ran, ran for their lives. And um, it would take a couple of days to get back to his uh, village where he was living. And he figured they'd probably be waiting for him, and he was right. And so he was smart enough to stay about a third of a mile away on a hilltop in, in some woods where he could stake out his house and, and see what was going on. And by the time he got there, uh, the secret police were already there. He could see his mom talking to them, uh, saying, I don't know where he is, you know, uh, and... And so anyway, he had to sleep in a barn in, in some hay for a few weeks until the coast was clear. And then fortunately, it wasn't long after that that the war ended. And so my father, uh, as a result of what he went through, is, is um, fiercely independent. I mean, as far as cherishing our freedoms is concerned because of what he went through. Well, after the war, because he and his cousins could speak some German, they were able to get into Germany because Germany had a manpower shortage. They were trying to rebuild after the war. And so his goal uh, was to work there for a while, save up enough money to be able to come to the U.S. And um, we had, he had an uncle uh, in the Dayton, Ohio area who would uh, uh, sponsor him in eventually. But anyway, while in Germany, he met my mother. Uh, and this is the southern part of Germany. Those who are uh, into geography, you'll recognize the area of Swabia, south of Stuttgart there, close to the Swiss border, beautiful part of Germany. And that's where my mom grew up. And in her small village of 300, they had a Nazi school teacher who was there to keep an eye on things. And uh, my grandpa uh, happened to be very outspoken against Hitler, especially if he had a little bit of wine to drink. It just seemed to open things up, and he would tell you what he really thought and not stop. And so uh, some of the friends in town said, Heinrich, if you don't shut up, you're going to get us all killed. 
And, but he kept talking, and so eventually one day, some secret police showed up in town looking for him. Fortunately, he wasn't home. He was out in the fields working somewhere, so they went to the mayor's office uh, trying to figure out where dad was at. And fortunately, and this was the Lord, uh, uh, the mayor happened to be a friend of the family's. In fact, my mother and his daughter were best friends, so he wasn't about to rat on my grandpa. So it's something like a scene out of a movie. He intentionally sent them in the wrong direction to another town and said, last time I saw him, he was over there. And as soon as they were out of sight, he tracked down my grandpa and said, you've got to get out of here. They're looking for you. And so he ended up having to live in the woods, um, in the forest, where at the time they had wild boars and wolves, and it's pretty dangerous, but God protected him. And and uh, he made it out of there alive. My parents eventually got married there and then uh, came to the States. They uh, immigrated legally. <laughs> These days, that's an important thing. If you haven't heard, about five million illegals have come into the U.S. in just the last two years alone. So I emphasize that point. But then <clears throat> they settled in the uh, Dayton, Ohio area, which is where I was born and grew up. And Every year or every other year, uh, we would have family reunions with all of my dad's cousins, and, and they would talk about, you know, what they went through uh, in the olden days. And so I became fascinated at a pretty young age with uh, foreign affairs, and um, I even remember watching the evening news as a fifth grader with my dad, which is really strange, I admit. But um, it was just, I had an interest. It was peaked at an early age. And um, then the summer after fifth grade, I accepted Christ as my Savior. And that following school year in sixth grade, I had a Christian school teacher in a public school who began to teach us world history. And one of the uh, subjects she covered was World War II. And at that point, everything just crystallized in my mind. Between what I learned from my parents and, and uh, what I was taught there in, in school, I remember thinking, how in the world could something so terrible have happened in, in, in Germany and Central Europe in a country that had so many Christians? You know, that's where the Reformation started, where the first Bibles were printed. And then look at what happened. And so I remember sitting there in my classroom, praying silently to the Lord. I said, Lord, if anything were to ever happen in this country, like what happened uh, in Europe during World War II, I promised you I will take a stand no matter the cost. And I meant, I meant it. Um, but, um, you know, at that age, you never think that the Lord is actually going to take you up on, on something like that. Um, but he did. And so let's fast forward over many years. I had the incredible opportunity of um, stepping into a position, as Carl mentioned, in our, in our state government, uh, eventually, officially became the Europe and Middle East trade specialist. And my job had to do with uh, doing everything possible to increase exports from our state to places overseas in order to create more jobs. And so immediately I began traveling all over the place. I was on the payroll of the state government, but when I was overseas, those meetings were organized through our American embassies at the federal level. So I got to know a lot of those people uh, as well. And uh, it was just an incredible uh, job. And one of the reasons I got it, uh, to see how the Lord works and, and can put pieces in place. And uh, no, that siren does not mean I'm done. I've just started, so we'll, <laughs> we'll fix that. So anyway, um, I grew up speaking Schwäbisch. For the, how many of you understand a little bit of German coming up here from Manitoba? I figure a few of you did, yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> I grew up speaking Swabian uh, at home because that was my mother's native tongue. Well, it just so happened that our state of Indiana was sister states with Baden-Württemberg, Germany, uh, which is where Schwabisch is spoken and where my mom came from. And, and so uh, that kind of set the stage and, and so... Um, before I knew it, I was in this incredible job. It was like a dream. And, um, but very quickly, I discovered some things that I just, it really caught me off guard. Um, overseas, I would usually spend two to four days in each city uh, setting up meetings 
uh, with the people at the embassies in order to then come back and lead a delegation of people from our state. And as I got to know these people at the embassies, I, I did meet a few Christians, I will say that up front, but they were few and far between. Uh, the people in our State Department already back in those days were very liberal, uh, very much in favor of globalization. They thought the United Nations was just a, a great thing and why not empower it and why not have a world government because after all then there could be world peace and world unity. Countries wouldn't be able to fight each other anymore and you know they, they bought into that narrative. And uh, it's amazing what you learn when you kind of keep quiet and ask questions. Uh, over time, people open up and, and share with you what they're, what they're thinking. And um, the thing that disturbed me the most, though, was some of the more hardcore people, globalists, in our State Department uh, were not very fond of Bible-believing Christians, nor were they fond of conservative Jews and Israel. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it came through loud and clear that some of these people just outright hated Israel. And so I thought, wow, these people are working in strategic positions in our government, and this is where they stand. And coming from my background, you could see why that's a big concern. And so uh, that launched me into uh, some moonlighting research that I began to do. I wanted to find out more about some of these people, their backgrounds, where they came from, how they came to believe the way that they did. And, um, and then I had some other events happen to me on the home front, also showing me how the pieces were being put in place for ultimately a, a, a global uh, system of, of government. And um, after a couple of years, I remember thinking back to the commitment I made as a kid. And I prayed to the Lord, Lord, where do I begin? How do I get this information out? Uh, you know, do I stand on a street corner and start talking about the New World Order, uh, which I don't think that would go over too well? Uh, where do I begin? What do I do? And I fervently prayed, and within a couple of weeks, um, a good friend of mine named Mike Green, who was working in the Indiana Secretary of State's office at the time, uh, as a right-hand assistant to our Secretary of State. Um, he led a Bible study group over at the State House in the Secretary of State's office, and he asked me to come over and share about some of these things that I'd been learning. And so I did so. And um, at that uh, Bible study that day were quite a few uh, state legislators and political officials and other Christians who worked for them and that just began to open up doors. After that meeting, I was invited to speak at other places and then uh, sometimes on Sunday evenings at churches and it just, it just began to happen. We didn't push any doors down or do any promoting. And that continued on for about 10 months or so. And then um, one day I was called into the office of the deputy director of our commerce department and he asked me to take a seat, and I could tell it was pretty serious. Something was going on. And he said, Gary, is it true that you've been speaking out against world government? I said, yes. He said, uh, don't you think that this possible trend toward a world government isn't just a natural evolution of the progress of mankind? In other words, what's wrong with it? Isn't it just kind of the natural flow of things? And so I said, no, I don't believe that's the case. I said, for one thing, there are organizations involved with a very specific agenda, and they're getting big money and financing to do what they're, they're doing. Uh, and I'm especially concerned because a lot of these people have a very strong anti-Christian overtone. And I, I shared with him a little bit about what my parents went through and why I was taking this stand. And he listened for, for quite a while. And then he cut me off, and he said, as long as you work for this administration, you will not talk about any of these things to any groups, regardless of their size, whether they are Christian or non-Christian. Is that understood? And before I could even think of a response, he said, you've been a tremendous asset to our administration, and we do not want to lose you, but the choice is yours. And that's how the meeting ended. So my job was on the line now suddenly, totally caught me off guard, went back to my office, and it was a beautiful office on the seventh floor overlooking our state capitol building. And I, I really didn't want to lose that office, I have to admit. Um, but I thought, 
well, you know, what do I do here? And, and I had an idea of what would end up happening, but I didn't want to jump uh, uh, to conclusions and make any rash decisions. So I decided to take one more trip overseas that I had already committed to. And this was a people-to-people -people delegation led by our Secretary of State, and he had invited me to come with him. And uh, they would be traveling into Finland, Russia, and China. And um, so I went ahead, I took that trip, and I thought, you know, this may well be my last trip uh, for the state. And uh, so why not make it count for the Lord? And in the days that led up to it, a Messianic uh, fellowship in Indianapolis that had been very supportive of, of me, they said, we just heard you're going into Russia. Could you take some Russian Hebrew translation New Testaments in with you? So uh, long story short, I ended up smuggling Bibles into Russia and also meeting with a Jewish refusenik and making a cassette tape recording of the persecution that he'd been going through. And all this was, was under the surface. We had to sneak away from our hotel to be able to do that. Anyway, that's a long story in itself. I'm not going to go there, but it was amazing what God did through that trip. And then, um, uh, and the whole time I was praying about my decision regarding my job, you know, and, and on the way home I was sitting in San Francisco at the airport waiting for a connecting flight, and the Lord gave me uh, the words to write in a letter of resignation. So when I got back to Indiana, I submitted that. I gave the administration three weeks' notice that I would be leaving, and, uh, and that was that. Um, but just for the record, I want to clear our lieutenant governor, who was the director of commerce, because he and I got along very well, and he was not the one that issued that ultimatum. It came down through a different uh, channel. And so... Um, um, Already at that time, you know, there were politics going on. You had globalists embedded in, in some strategic positions. And it was those people who came down real hard on me. But anyway, so I left my job. And um, up until that point in time, my wife and I, we really had a wonderful, fairly easy existence. Young profession, professionals and um, moving up the ladder, so to speak. And... Um, once I left my job, everything changed, almost overnight. Uh, we came to understand the real meaning of spiritual warfare, and it began almost immediately. You see, I had a job lined up, a part-time job, that uh, I would be able to work two or three days a week, and another two or three days a week, I could work on researching and writing my first book, En Route to Global Occupation. And so it you know, made it easier for me to leave my job. Well, the company that had brought me on board to work for them, all of a sudden, a guy from California comes along and may, makes an outrageous offer to buy out that company. Uh, he offered two to three times what the company was believed to be worth at the time, and so the owner couldn't turn it down, sold the company. My job was immediately eliminated, along with uh, the jobs of the three or four people who were responsible for bringing me on board. It's either a strange coincidence or, or calculated. To this day, I don't know. But So immediately, the rug was pulled out from, from under uh, my feet, and, um, and then it became more and more difficult uh, from there. Uh, at one point during an eight-month period, Audrey was in three car accidents, one of them totaling our car. So the, the time that it took dealing with insurance companies and repair shops and on and on, and, and then my dad's place of business in Dayton, Ohio, burned to the ground a complete loss. Um, and, and they were helping some to support us uh, by that time. And, and so it's just one thing after another. If any of you have ever read uh, Frank Peretti's first novel, This Present Darkness, it was as if he was writing about our lives. I'm not kidding you. It's just... We were getting smacked from one side, but on the other side, God was providing and helping us to keep going. So what I thought would take two years took six years, as Carl mentioned, but we finally got the book done, and it came out around 1992. And it was in God's perfect timing, because right around that time is when George Bush Sr. was talking a lot about the New World Order. Some of you will remember that. Uh, not just once or twice, but regularly he was bringing up that terminology seemingly every chance he had and people were wondering what is this all about and so it was right about then that that my book came out and um, uh, uh, pastor chuck smith 
of the Calvary Chapels of Costa Mesa, California, uh, became the first pastor in the country to openly endorse the book. He quoted from it from the pulpit and told all of his people to go out there and get a copy of it. And that, that helped a lot. And then um, uh, with God's help, I became a, a regular on, um, uh, on a Dallas program called Point of View with Marlon Maddox and also Beverly LaHaye Le- Live out of Washington, D.C., and, and the ball just began to roll, and that's how our, our ministry really was launched. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I want to backtrack just a little bit and share an experience I had with an actual one-world, pro-one-world government organization. And the name of this group was called the World Constitution and Parliament Association. So the name kind of says it all. It's pretty blatant. But at the time, you couldn't find out about them. This was before websites or anything like that existed. They found out about you. And through a series of events, they decided that they wanted to have me in their organization, not realizing where I was really coming from on this. They figured I was the Europe and Middle East trade specialist in Indiana. Uh, my parents came from Europe. Uh, I was an economics major with a focus on the international side of things. So. You know, my resume would have looked like somebody who'd be a globalist. And so I was invited into this organization and for four years uh, collected uh, documents that they sent to me. Uh, Some of this stuff was so incredibly blatant and I did reproduce some of it in the back of of my book, En Route to Global Occupation. So believe me, I'm I'm telling the truth, I'm not making this up and I can document it. Uh, But this organization had already been involved in holding uh, dress rehearsal type meetings for a world parliament. They had drafted a world constitution through their meetings, a prototype world constitution, dividing the world into a number of economic and political regions uh, with a a type of world court, a world military, all this thought through. Now you might laugh, you'd say, you know, who are these crazy people if they think they're gonna pull this off? Uh, But once you recognize who some of the people are in the organization or were at that time, you realize that this was something pretty serious. The leaders of at least a a couple hundred different organizations belonged to this group. So it's kind of like spokes going out from the center of a wheel. And I'll give you some examples. One of the vice presidents of the World Constitution and Parliament Association was Dr. Enamula Khan, who was the president of the World Muslim Congress out of Pakistan. Arguably, by according to some people, the most powerful Muslim in the world at that time. Another vice president was our former U.S. Attorney General, Ramsey Clark. This guy was over our Justice Department and over our FBI. And yet he belonged to this organization trying to bring about a world government. Um, Gerhard Havel of the World Federalist Association out of Germany, Hans-Peter Dürr, who was on the executive committee of Greenpeace, um, was a vice president. Also, um, some other people involved, uh, Cynthia Waddell. She was the former president of the World Council of Churches, which has been moving us in this direction of global unification of the religious realms. She belonged to the organization. Maybe the biggest surprise was uh, the name of Eagle Arvik. On some of the stationery that I received, the letters I received from this organization, his name was the first one listed up on top. Eagle Arvik, the chairman of the Nobel Prize Committee, which explained a lot because this organization was stacked with Nobel Prize recipients. And I'm not going to say that everyone who receives the Nobel Prize is a globalist. But many of them are, and they have used the Nobel Peace Prize to elevate uh, their stature in the world, and then a lot of these people end up becoming spokespeople for the globalist movement. Uh, So a lot of Nobel Prize recipients in the organization. And um, I remember mayors of prominent cities, Canadian cities, U.S. cities, cities from around the world, former UN ambassadors, foreign ambassadors of of various types uh, belonging uh, to this organization. Uh, All the religions were represented. They'd covered every every base. And their goal at that time, as best as I could tell, was 
to begin to lay the groundwork so that when this globalist movement would eventually go public, which it would have to at some point if you're ever going to bring it about, right? You can't keep it private forever. But as it would go public, they would present this as a global, we the people, democratic movement. They would try to bring this about in the name of, of democracy, and we're seeing some of that today. So this was a bottom-up approach, and of course there's the top-down approach as well, uh, coming down through our political organizations and our, our, our governments. And so this was their role uh, in all of this and, and facilitating it. Um, I was intrigued with the fact that the three main organizers for this organization, including the Secretary General, Philip Isley, also <clears throat> were key figures in an organization called World Union. I had never heard of that organization before, but I thought it must be significant if the three top leaders or organizers belong to it. So I researched it, came to find out it was headquartered in India, of all places, and that it was sister organizations with a very occultic group called World Goodwill, which was headquartered in London, England, and New York City. That organization, World Goodwill, was founded by Alice Bailey, who oftentimes today is referred to as the mother of the New Age movement. She was heavily involved in, in the occult. And back in 1922, she founded Lucifer Publishing Company. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. And I do document that in, in uh, my second book, The New World Religion. We have one of her title pages from one of her first books. And right there it says, 135 Broadway, New York City, Lucifer Publishing Company. And uh, two years after starting that organization, she smartly changed the name to Lucis Trust. That organization still exists today. It's been very uh, instrumental and influential at the United Nations. A lot of people are not aware of that connection at all. But to bring it back around, to think that the main organizers of, the, of this World Constitutional Parliament Association were just slightly removed from Lucifer Publishing Company, you know? And just to take you through it again, I want, I want you to get this in your mind. So you have Lucifer Publishing Company, now called Lucis Trust, the founder of that also founded World Goodwill, which is sister organizations with World Union to whom uh, these people belonged. So I wanted to make that connection to show you that this is a religious motivation ultimately behind this. These people were heavily involved in New Age practices, going into altered states of consciousness and channeling, all that kind of stuff. In fact, Alice Bailey, she wrote her books with the assistance of her, she called him a spirit guide. He actually had a name, she called him Jual Kul. And sometimes she'd refer to him as the Tibetan master. And according to her husband, she would go into a room, put herself into a trance, and three days or so later come out with a book several hundred pages thick, manuscript, through automatic writing. This spirit guide, nothing more than a demonic spirit would just dictate to her and she would just write it down. She became a channel literally for, for demons. Um, and you won't hear that anywhere through our mass media, but they ought to be all over this because the New Age One World Movement is a huge phenomenon in our days, and yet it's rooted in these kinds of, of teachings and beliefs. Anyway, I'm going way longer than I, I, I thought I would on, on this particular thing. I want to uh, move on now. So they were laying the groundwork, and then Bush began talking about the New World Order. That was a huge signal to these people that their time was coming, that they need to ramp it up. It was still behind the scenes largely at this time, but their goal was to come out in the year 2000. They felt they would have enough people worldwide support their agenda by that time that they could begin to come out uh, into the open. And so in the year 2000, there were three meetings that took place between the last week of August and around September 10th or 12th of that year, all of them in New York City. Uh, the first one uh, had to do with the leading religious leaders of the world, the top religious leaders of the world from all the different religions, about a thousand of them got together in New York City. This event was uh, funded largely by Ted Turner, <clears throat> excuse me, with the blessing of Mikhail Gorbachev and some other heavyweights. 
And the goal of it was to begin to bring the world's religions together because you have to have a lot of cooperation in that area if you're ever going to have a, a one world uh, economic political system. And so uh, a few steps were taken in that direction as a result of that meeting. A few days later, also in New York, there was a meeting of the heads of state of the world. And there were about 200 countries in the world at that time. 160 heads of state were there. That's 80% of the top leaders of the world to discuss the topic of globalization. Now, the media talked about them meeting, but they didn't tell us what it was all about. They even had a ceremonial uh, signing table in an adjacent room where the, the leaders, the heads of state, could go to sign international treaties to help expedite this move toward uh, global government. And then uh, just a couple of days after that, uh, there was also a meeting in New York dealing with the economic leaders of the world, uh, the top people from academia and the media. And so between these three meetings, uh, I would venture to say, at least not in the post-flood era since the time of Noah, have so many powerful people in the world gotten together in one place at the same time to promote this agenda. But the biggest meeting came a couple of months later. It was November 4th and 5th of the year 2000. It took place in Rome, Italy. It was organized by the Pope. Approximately 5,000 people were in attendance. Most of them, the vast majority of them, were members of parliaments from the various governments around the world. And so the meeting was dubbed a meeting of the world's parliament just for fun. That wasn't the official name of it. But they had that many parliamentarians from around the world present. Again, all to promote this globalist agenda. That event got no media coverage through the major media. Only Zenit News Agency covered it, and that's how we found out about it. Otherwise, we'd not even know that that event took place. So all that told me that th this was really going to begin moving forward more rapidly. And then, of course, we had 9-11 uh, shortly after, and um, you know, a lot of our freedoms began to be taken away as a result of that. Uh, but President Bush Jr., who was in power at that time, uh, he was, in my opinion, a conflicted president. He had some Christian conservative advisors, but he also had some globalist advisors. And um, the last two years of his second term, between 2006 and 2008, it just seemed like he'd almost given up, like things just began, began to fall in place for globalists. And, and then Barack Obama came in, and uh, everything was ramped into high gear. Uh, a lot got accomplished during his years for the globalists, and that resulted in a backlash that developed that put Donald Trump into office. And I think that was quite unexpected. Um, I believe uh, they figured Hillary Clinton was a sure bet, and she casually uh, took her election for granted. And the next thing you know, Donald Trump became president, and he began to undo some of the things that the globalists had been putting in place. And they didn't like that too much. And so we all saw what, what happened. And so now Biden is in office, and we're in a free fall in the United States, to put it simple. We, our, our country is in serious trouble on, on every front. Um, and, and things are moving very quickly in the direction of this globalist agenda. So to talk just a little bit uh, before wrap, uh, wrapping up about the timetable and the strategy of the globalists. Um, I got a somewhat of a handle on this just a few months ago. I was on Curtis Bauer's program. I don't know if you uh, get his program up here in Canada. He's a, a Christian documentary producer. And uh, it was a really good interview. Uh, and uh, a day or two later, he contacted us and said, there's a guy who listened to the program, got in touch with me, and he said he really, really needs to talk to you. Is it okay if I give him your phone number? So I said, sure, that's fine. So I ended up on the phone with this gentleman for a good, good hour. And um, he's a believer. He'd grown a lot in the last couple of years as a result of his experiences. But to make a long story short, he's a huge rancher in a Latin country. And 
there were some problems, some issues on his land that were legitimate problems dealing with the environment. And so he began to take a stand on certain things. And through that, got introduced through the back door basically to the global environmental movement, which he didn't realize at that time was part and parcel with the One World Movement. I mean, these are connected at the hip. There's a huge interfacing between the global environmental movement and just the, the whole One World push itself. And so through that, uh, he began to realize who some of the heavyweights were in the globalist movement. And a guy who took him under his wings happened to be a, a key member of the World Economic Forum. And so he just began to play along with this to see where it would go. And he told me just like a month or so, just weeks before we were talking on the phone, he had had lunch with this individual and uh, presented a, a question that went something like this. Hey, as fast as we're moving toward the Great Reset, do you think it might all come together yet this year? which was last year, 2022. And he barely got those words out of his mouth when the guy said, 2024, 2024. So clearly, he knows something that's going on within the World Economic Forum that they're targeting uh, the year 2024. And I believe a lot of things are going to happen between now and then. Um, but 2024, 2025, from then on, I think it, this whole effort is going to be much more public. Now, I want to say I never, ever set dates. It's really foolish to do so because uh, it denies the God factor, right? We know that the Lord can push things back, and he's done so before. And so I'm not saying anything is going to happen in 2024. I'm saying that's what they're saying. Uh, uh, even though I don't set dates, I believe it is helpful to know what our adversaries are thinking. It gives us an idea of what they want to bring about and where they're going. Uh, so maybe we can all pray into this situation and some roadblocks will be thrown up in the next couple of years. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. But my, my new friend told me in no uncertain terms that this Great Reset Agenda is demonic in nature, his words, with various occult-based secret societies lending their support and leading the charge from behind the scenes. Satan, you have to understand, is an expert in crisis management or crisis manipulation. He's a master deceiver. His strategy is to first create a crisis, then fan the flames and make it a lot worse to the point where people are up in arms over it, and then come in with the solution on his terms. That's how Satan operates. He creates the problem, then comes in with the solution on his terms. And it's also called the Hegelian dialectic, named after a German philosopher that basically wrote all this out. And so it bears, bears his name. But that's where we're at right now. You see, if the world was in pretty good shape and things, the economy was all right, everything was flowing well, there's no reason for people to go through a major change and accept something very different that they might perceive under normal circumstances as being threatening so all these crises have to be created to make people think, wow, our world's falling apart. You know, we're, we may destroy ourselves if things keep going down this path. And I believe then the globalists are going to step in with the solution. They managed to spawn a crisis um, in the U.S. on our border with, with Mexico, over 5 million illegals including, they estimate, hundreds of terrorists that have come into the country in the last two years. So who knows what that's all going to lead to. They've managed to generate unprecedented lawlessness and crime in our streets. In most big cities in the U.S., our crime has double, doubled or tripled in the last couple of years. Social and racial tensions in our culture, there's rampant confusion and immorality uh, brought upon our children through the schools and universities. Uh, many of them now don't know if they're a boy or girl or if they should have a sex change. And this is even getting to be a big issue in our churches. Uh, a youth group uh, at an evangelical church not far from the church we attend, uh, about 90 or so kids in their youth group, recently we, we found out that seven of them were considering sex changes. Now they're trying to pass laws where parents don't even have to be notified 
where young kids can go through with this without having to tell their parents. Unbelievable stuff. The ultimate aim of those behind the so-called Great Reset is to gain complete control of the world's social, religious, and financial structures in order to install a centralized and strictly regulated totalitarian international system similar to that of China's social credit system, but with a Luciferic religious component. And some of those in the higher levels of this movement actually believe that Lucifer is the god of light and that he is warring on behalf of mankind against Adonai, the god of the Christians and Jews, who is the god of darkness. And Lucifer's goal is to liberate mankind from the bondage that Adonai has placed mankind under. The commandments, the rules, the standards for living. So this is literally a type of so-called liberation theology. It's, it's complete all-out rebellion and lawlessness. And it's interesting, in, in uh, 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, the Antichrist is referred to in the NIV as the man of lawlessness. And we're, we're, we're seeing this lawlessness now take shape, where what used to be good is now being considered evil, and what was once evil is now considered good. And we've seen this take place fairly quickly. These individuals will do whatever it takes to achieve their goal, including precipitating World War III. If you think about it, World War I led to the League of Nations afterwards, the first kind of public step in the direction of a, a, a globalist political uh, organization. Then there was World War II, 20 years later, that led to the forming of the United Nations, which has the infrastructure of a world government, but they don't have all the power that they want. So it only stands to reason that perhaps there's going to be a third world war and that in the aftermath of that, that people will be conditioned to the point where they would embrace an all-out one-world system. And I think that's kind of where, where things are headed. And I believe that the current uh, war in Ukraine uh, may well escalate over the next couple of years. And I have good reason for believing that. Uh, but the world's current economic financial system has to be brought to its knees before the globalist new digital cashless system can be effectively introduced as their only solution. And for that to occur, energy prices must continue to increase, inflation must soar, supply chains must be disrupted, and food and basic commodities must become scarce. That's all part of this agenda. The fact is the global elite who are committed to the pursuit of a one world government and financial system desperately need this war to be able to help set the stage for what they're trying to bring about. Never mind the fact that tens of thousands of innocent Russian and Ukrainian civilians are going to be killed in the process and already thousands of soldiers have perished because of, of this war. It's really sickening what, what's taking place. I believe this war could have been completely avoided, uh, but it was Western intelligence that helped to overthrow the government in Ukraine and bring all this about. If you remember the Sochi Winter Olympics in 2014, this was, they took place in Russia. Uh, this was Putin's moment to showcase his country to the rest of the world. And in the middle of the Olympics, the government, the pro-Russia government of Ukraine was overthrown. And I remember looking at my wife and I said, they've poked the bear one time too many. There's no way that Putin is going to take this lying down. And within days, he went into Crimea. And that started this whole thing. Now, our intelligence agencies had to know that Putin would respond that way. Because the Black Sea is incredibly strategic to Russia. And Ukraine, whoever controls Ukraine, has control of the Black Sea. So I can tell you right now, Putin is never going to give up Ukraine. It's just not going to happen, uh, especially not eastern Ukraine, which borders on, on the Black Sea. So I personally believe this war was intentionally precipitated and that barring divine intervention, it's going to continue to escalate and turn into a much uh, broader conflict. The U.S. and our allies are cleverly being drawn into this war. In fact, the U.S. is now providing over 60% of the military resources 
uh, for Ukraine, including Patriot missiles, which when we announced that a little bit over a month ago, Putin saw that as a de declaration of war by the U.S. against Russia. That's how it was perceived over there. And now we've announced uh, that we'd be delivering the Abrams tanks. That is in motion. So for all practical purposes, the U.S. is already at war with Russia. It's as if we're fighting a, uh, a proxy war through Ukraine with Russia. And all this has happened in just a year's time, almost to the, what, next week it'll be a, a year. Putin has warned the U.S. repeatedly, at least six times that I'm aware of, to back down or else. And I quoted him in one of our publications last spring where he said, we have technologies right now that no one else can boast of. We're not going to brag about it. We're just going to use them if we have to. And I think that's kind of where we're at right now. And I think he's talking about a potential broad, wide-scale cyber attack or an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, which would be devastating, or possibly even a limited nuclear attack. Uh, none of those can be ruled out. And can you imagine how the world would react if something like that happened? You know, it would bring humanity to the point, I believe, where people would consider uh, a global system in the aftermath. So what's going on in Ukraine, it really is, uh, I mean, it's a, an absolute human tragedy and incredibly devastating. Um, I have the, the privilege of serving on the International Board of Directors of Ebenezer Operation Exodus, which is a Christian Alia ministry that has been assisting uh, Jewish people, many of them persecuted Jews from around the world, uh, to move to Israel and relocate there from, from various countries. And um, our last board meeting took place in Budapest, Hungary, because we're very active right now inside of Ukraine as well as in Russia. We have staff in both countries helping Jewish people to get out. Poland is now full. I mean, they've, they've taken in so many people. And, and so more and more uh, Jews as well as, as Christians and others are coming into Hungary now and also to an extent Moldova and Romania. And so that's why our meeting was in, in Budapest. And um, I learned a lot while we were there that you don't hear about in the, in the mass media. One of the things I discovered from our, our sources in, in those countries was that the chief rabbis in Ukraine last, I think it was last April, uh, urged the Jewish community to get out. They want all Jews out of Ukraine within two years, they said last April. So in just a little bit over a year from now, they want all Jews out of there, which tells me they're clearly expecting this war to escalate. And they don't want to be on the wrong side of, of history uh, after what happened in World War II. And so uh, a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Also, many Jews trying to get out of Russia right now, some of them through Finland, where they can stay for a few days without a visa, and then from there they uh, make arrangements to, to move on. And so a lot of Bible prophecy really being fulfilled. If I had time, I could point you to over 40 passages of Scripture in the Old Testament that prophesied that in the last days, the last of the last days, that the Jewish people would be gathered from all the nations of the world and return back to Israel. And as of last month, approximately 47% of all the Jews in the world are now back in the land. That's almost twice the percentage of Jews who lived in Israel when Jesus was there, believe it or not. That, that's, that's an amazing statistic when you think about it. So this is just one more sign of the times. Well, this is a good place to, to wrap up this first session. So I just want to, want to close out by emphasizing the fact that if these things really are happening, which they are, then we as Christians need to be walking more closely with the Lord than ever before. And we need to pray for an extra measure of discernment and, and also for guidance, because I believe the Lord has a task for every single one of us in these days that remain of what he wants us to do and so we are not to be passive christians that just watch things unfold but i believe that there will be major exploits great exploits as the book of daniel says 
uh, conducted by believers in the end times. So in the midst of things getting more and more difficult, we're still going to have opportunities to get out the gospel and to shine the spotlight on, on Jesus and what he has done for us through uh, his atoning sacrifice on the cross. So we cannot forget about the gospel of Christ. Rather, we need to use the events of our day to, as a platform to be able to share the gospel with people. Amen? All right. Thanks, Gary. We're going to take a little break now. We, we want to give you an opportunity to stand up a bit uh, during the day and stretch your legs. And uh, we're going to be uh, uh, covering a lot of uh, material today. So uh, there is coffee and refreshments set up uh, on at the rear, on the back here, on, on either side. So uh, have a, uh, take a moment, stretch your legs, and uh, we'll be... Uh, resuming in about 15 minutes or so again. <laughs> 